friends, this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Friends, I'd like to just say that Reverend Joya and I have had a long 16, 17 months parenting small children and pastoring a church. And so we are looking at August as sort of a time of rest and preparation for our kickoff in September. Therefore, we will be doing our entire worship online through the month of August. There will not be in-person worship. And we will be reusing some clips that we have already generated so that we don't need to create more work for ourselves during this time so that we can plan ahead into the fall and be rested and ready to go. I know you will all understand. So as I will be reusing this clip week to week, I want to remind you that the best way to stay up to date with all of the things that are happening in the life of the church is to read your e-news. If you have any questions, you can certainly call the office. And if you need to reach out to Reverend Joyer or I, except for when we are on vacation, we happily will return your emails and voice calls. Um, we are still mostly working from home, so please keep that in mind. If you leave a message on our office voicemail, it's probably best to um, reach out via email as well. Friends, our God loves us. Our God wants us to rest. Our God wants us to find restoration in him. And so let us all join together today and every day this month as we worship our God in joy and in thanksgiving. Good morning, friends. I wonder if you've heard of the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Well, as I was reading the story again in the Bible, it got me to wondering, how many of you pack your lunch for school? Or maybe your parents or caregivers help you pack your lunch for school. When I pack my kids' lunch for school, I always try to put in a fruit, maybe some vegetables, a drink, a sandwich or something warm. My sons like soup. They really like to have soup in their lunch or macaroni and cheese. But it's enough for them and only them. When I'm packing their lunch, I'm not thinking about other kids because some of our friends have food allergies, some of our friends have other types of allergies, and I know that my kids are not allowed to share their lunch at school. So when I am focused on packing their lunches, I'm only thinking about them. Well, you know, there's a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 when he had gone away to a place and was preaching and teaching and people just kept coming and coming and coming. And I'm sure a lot of people were just walking by and were interested in what he was saying and decided to stay. But the time got really long. As Jesus was preaching and teaching and the time went on and on, the disciples said, hey Jesus, these people have been here for a long time and they're far away from any particular town or village. We need to find a way to feed them. And there's 5,000 of them. So Jesus, rightfully so, assumed that some of them probably packed a lunch. And so he had the disciples go out into the crowd and ask the people who packed a lunch if they wouldn't mind sharing. But when they came back, all they had was five loaves of bread and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish is not going to be enough to feed all 12 disciples, let alone to feed 5,000 people. So Jesus performed a miracle. Jesus prayed over the food and told the disciples to put it in baskets and to share it around with all of the people that were gathered there. And guess what? There was enough. In fact, there was so much that people ate until they were full. Now, why do you think we have that story in the Bible? I think we have that story in the Bible because that's what Jesus wants us to do. Jesus wants us to share what we have with others. Because when we share and we give to others, we multiply blessings. We can create miracles. We can make sure that everybody has enough. So friends, as we are having our summer and we aren't packing our, maybe we're packing our lunches for camp and things like that, but as we are eating and being mindful of all the blessings that we have, let us remember those who don't, who, who don't have enough. 
and make sure that we take time to set aside some of our wonderful things so that everybody can have enough. To that end, we will be taking donations from church members starting in August for our November uh, fair. And that's one way you can give of some of your stuff. You can always donate to the church to help us with our outreach, min outreach ministries, or you can donate to a favorite local charity. That way we can all make sure that everybody has enough. So friends, it's a wonderful story. We couldn't have made it happen, but God did. So I wonder if you will help me pray. Dear God, just as Jesus used the lunch of a few people to feed more than 5,000 people, we pray that you will use us all to bless everyone that they meet each day, everyone that we meet each day. Amen. And friends, let us now pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, friends. <laughs> verses 42 to 44. A man came from Baal Shalishah, bringing food from the first fruits to the man of God, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. Elisha said, give it to the people and let them eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred people? So he repeated, 
Give it to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. He said it before them, they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. A reading this week comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew that he, what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about five thousand in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come to take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to, to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. Friends, let us pray. Holy and life-giving God, may the words of my mouth be a reflection of your light, and may our hearts and minds be open to receive it. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a, a rare visit with my family. My father and brother were both in town. And as you know, these family reunions are very special these days. I was so excited to spend time with them. I had the idea to bring them to a nearby park and take a walk around the lake and then go stop somewhere nearby for lunch. Only as with most things these days, nothing ever seems to turn out quite as planned. As I was pulling up the car alongside the little booth to pay the fee to enter the state park, we were all alarmed at the sound of a very loud crash. We were actually convinced that I had crashed into the toll booth because that's how loud it was and the toll booth clerk kind of acted like that. But luckily, it was only a blown tire. And we have a spare, and we have triple A. But waiting for triple A meant that our lunch plans would not come nearly as soon as we had hoped. Quickly, I looked around to see what food I could possibly forage from the car. In addition to Gael's snacks, which are always on hand, I was able to find a jar of peanuts and a half bag of pretzels. Those peanuts and pretzels became for us a heavenly banquet. The four of us, my dad, my brother, Keo, and myself, lasted on those peanuts and pretzels for quite a few hours, and we were all satisfied. In situations like this, I tend to think about today's scripture story of the feeding of the multitudes, also sometimes called the story of the loaves and the fishes. The story of how a little bit can really go such a long way and how so many of us listening have so much 
more than we think we have. But for a number of reasons, I wouldn't quite call my story miraculous. After all, the peanuts and the pretzels only held us over for a couple of hours. Eventually, we did go out and eat. Today's scripture says that Jesus and his followers were surrounded by a huge crowd of hungry people, around 5,000 of them. They spot a boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus takes the loaves, gives thanks, and then distributes them to everyone. There's tons of food. They all eat as much as they want, and there are baskets and baskets of leftovers. This was, by all accounts, a miracle. A sign and wonder of God's extraordinary presence in our lives. The Latin root of the word miracle, mirari, means to be amazed or to marvel. I like the Catholic definition of miracles, that they are wonders of a peculiar kind, signs of some special mission that are explicitly ascribed to God. And this miraculous feeding of the multitudes is the only miracle that you find in all four Gospels. That means it's very important. We, human beings, tend to think in terms of systems and predictability. We think of plans. But miracles provide this awesome reminder of God's capacity to break those schemes wide open and point us to a deeper dimension of life, of faith, of trust. The great theologian C.S. Lewis reminds us that to be Christian is to accept the one grand miracle and to believe that the God who was and is and is to come can and will continue to work the miraculous in our lives and in the life of the church. He believed that God is always at work doing just this, but mostly we don't pay attention. Jesus' feeding of the multitudes apparently wasn't the first time this miraculous multiplication of food was witnessed and enjoyed. It also happened in our Old Testament scripture from 2 Kings. The prophet Elisha stands among all the great prophets, and his role is in line with what all prophetic figures do. Keep the people of Israel focused on God and focused on their covenantal relationship to care for each other. Leading up to today's story, there is a series of not one, not two, not even three, but five back-to-back -back miracles. I invite you to read this chapter, chapter four, if you're interested. And today's reading is about the last one, the fifth miracle. It's about Elisha's ability to feed a hundred people with a tiny bit of food. Strikingly, the story begins with an act of great generosity. It begins with the announcement that a man comes bringing his first fruits. That would, that would have been called a holy offering, the best his crop had to offer to Elisha. There's no indication that he has any obligation to provide food to Elisha, nor any mention that Elisha is in need of food. Instead, the giver arrives only in a spirit of generosity. Elisha then commands a servant to spread this small supply of bread to a hundred people. So the man protests. How can I set this before a hundred people, he asks. Maybe he was afraid of the response. Imagine the embarrassment at, at serving dinner for two to a party of 20. 
Maybe he was <clears throat> disappointed that Elisha didn't just keep the gift for himself. After all, it was a gift for him. Perhaps the man was just confused. But for whatever reason, Elisha decides to share this gift with everyone, saying, give it to the people and let them eat. And they do. As a little child, Jesus would have heard this story and others about Elisha and the other prophets and the miraculous works of God. And he would have also heard his mother, Mary, singing, singing about how God lifts up the lowly and fills the hungry with good things. Jesus enacted his mother's song well. Everywhere he went, he broke the vicious cycles of poverty, fear, even death. He healed, he transformed, he brought new life. Performing these signs and wonders was another way for Jesus to enact his mother's song. Rearranging the world wherever he went, the blind received their sight, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are fed. The feeding of the multitudes is one more potent example of this new world coming into being. The biblical writers who write about these signs and write about these wonders must have looked at the world in a very special way. They saw the possibility of the inbreaking of God's divine love. They saw the possibility of healing that you never thought was possible, securing a job that you never thought you'd be considered for, getting a surprise call from an old friend, having an unforeseeable connection with a stranger, witnessing our moral convictions actually influence, influencing legislation in Washington, D.C. The storyteller makes a leap to somewhere beyond stretching our imaginations past what we think is possible. Almost three months ago, some of you know this, I got rear-ended uh, while stopped at a yield sign. My car was actually fine, but my back took a hit. I've been suffering from the effects of whiplash ever since, and over these past three months, I have been treating my back in various ways. Chiropractics, massage therapy, and physical therapy. My physical therapist has given me many exercises to work on, which I'm supposed to do daily. I do them most days. Anyway, among the exercises he gave me are a series of stretches. And I have to be honest. Of all the treatments I have done on my back, I have been most surprised by the results from stretching. Stretching has allowed my back to heal in ways, honestly, I couldn't have imagined. And I'm learning about how stretching opens up blood flow and circulation and increases hydration to my muscle tissue and increases my range of motion and flexibility. On some level, I am convinced that stretching has taken my body to a healthier place than it was even before the accident. I share this with you today, siblings, sisters, brothers, because I have come to understand miracles as a kind of spiritual stretching. And let's be honest, there hasn't been a huge amount of great news flowing our way over this past year and a half. We've been pretty super saturated with all that we should fear and worry about. We expect 
the news to be grim and depressing. So I think it's time that we do some spiritual healing, some spiritual stretching to make more room for the abundant light to break in, for joy and goodness and positivity to lift us up, more room to let our imaginations soar into the realm of what God makes possible. Do you ever pray for a miracle? Do you pray for a wonder of a peculiar kind, a sign of special importance? Do you pray that God would intervene? I do. Friends, there are times when we just have to acknowledge that we don't know, we can't know the outcome of every situation. There's no script that we're all following, and even the so-called laws of nature aren't all figured out just yet. In the words of author Tony DeLiso, keep your best wishes close to your heart and watch what happens. We have to believe on some level that the world we dream about is possible, that the life we imagine is conceivable, because only then can we be stretched to pursue that world and pursue that life, even when it feels beyond our grasp. When the disciples are charged with feeding the hungry crowd, they found a child with five loaves and two fish, and he gave it to Jesus. Then Jesus blessed it, and he gave it all away. He showed us what we should be praying for, striving for, and stretching to achieve. Because if we consider the world today, if we consider the number of people who hunger and thirst for food or other material things or emotional things or even spiritual things, we have to acknowledge that it would take a miracle to feed us all. But this miraculous act teaches us a lesson that is actually excruciatingly simple. If what we possess is shared, there is enough for all. Some of you may be familiar with the folktale Stone Soup. It's about a group of travelers that come to a village with nothing more than an empty cooking pot. When they arrive, the villagers are unwilling to share any of their food with the hungry travelers. So the travelers go to a stream and fill the pot with water and drop a large stone in it. Then they place it over a fire. One of the villagers becomes curious and asks, what they're doing. The travelers answer that they're making stone soup, which tastes wonderful and which they would be delighted to share with the villager, although it still needs a little bit of garnish, which they're missing to improve the flavor. The villager, who anticipates enjoying some of the soup, does not mind parting with a few carrots. So these are added to the soup. Another villager walks by inquiring about the pot, and the travelers again mention that their soup has not yet reached its full potential. The villager hands them a little bit of seasoning. More and more and more, the villagers walk by, each adding another ingredient until finally the stone is removed from the pot, and a delicious and nourishing pot of soup is enjoyed by all. Was this a miracle? Soup from a stone?
perhaps. God is always at work, my friends. So it's time to start paying attention. The good news this morning is that we worship a God of the miraculous. And today we're invited to commune with the miraculous, to stretch ourselves wide open into the life and into the world that God imagines for us and to be agents of this miraculous life for all people. Amen. Good morning, friends. It is July 25th, and I ask that you please join with me in prayer. Loving God, you are both our creator and our sustainer. And when you open your hand to us, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and in your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowds with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you would again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all who hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We pray for the people who are experiencing famine or wildfire or food shortage. We pray for those who are suffering the effects of malnutrition we pray for those who are suffering from other food-related calamities. We pray for those who are feeling empty this day emotionally, who are longing and are lonely for love and companionship, who are caught in the grip of depression or are overwhelmed by grief. We ask that you open your hand and pour out your spirit on all of these. We pray for those who are troubled but don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning but don't know where to look, who need you, God, but don't yet know you. Be with them and fill them with your Holy Spirit. God, on this day, we pray for all those who know varying health challenges. We pray for those who are recovering from illness. We pray for those who are facing illness. We lift up to you our beloved Pat Kalella, who is facing a cancer diagnosis. We pray for everyone who is mourning. We pray for everyone who is in need. And we pray for the people that we can only name now from the silence of our hearts. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as well and fill us with your compassion and love so that we would willingly share some of our abundance with those who have deep need this day. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who came that all of humanity might come to know the abundant life that comes from you, O oh God. Amen. <laughs> 